attempt. All right, let's get rolling. Last week we uh, kind of fell behind, and we continue to be a little bit behind. So we're going to wrap up the integrated control concept, uh, the birth of IPM, and then we're going to move into our next topic, which is going to be touching on pest ecology. So as far as announcements are concerned, I went out and I checked out the alfalfa, and it's still a little bit too cold. There's not much of anything going on out there. So if you were looking at the schedule of lab events, this week was sort of a flex week. It could either be IPM resources or it could be the alfalfa sampling. So it'll be the IPM resources. Hopefully we'll have some stuff out in the alfalfa next week so we can trump around out there and get some collecting done. So consequently, uh, we'll be going over some of the big IPM resources that are available uh, to you online. So we'll be meeting in lab uh, 119. And then we'll move up to 229 part of the way through. It should be a relatively short lab day. So as far as the quiz uh, that was due today, uh, we had these two questions. So this first one, an organism's blank describes its role of places in the community, as well as the combination of conditions it requires to maintain a viable population. So which one was this? A. Yeah, it was ecological niche. And that one was relatively easy. 93% of everybody got it. So uh, more or less what I did was I more or less copied the definition right out of the book. That's kind of the way a lot of these tests are going to be. There might be questions that are a little bit in depth, but they are going to mimic what's in the book. Uh, and then the next one, predation is a classic example of density dependent, of a density dependent factor. Right, and that's true, and 100% of people got that one. So there you go, there's your two points. Uh, or on average, 1.96 points uh, for the class. So that's pretty good. All right, so getting back to where we were, uh, we, when we wrapped up, we were talking about Stern et al. Uh, Stern et al. was a paper that was written back in 1959 where a bunch of UC researchers really outlined uh, uh, basically, they outlined problems with the way the control was being done at the time and came up with some solutions uh, that they saw as being what we needed to do to move forward with more responsible pest control. And they outlined three major things, accurate thresholds, having better sampling methods, and using selective insecticides. And ultimately, these three things have morphed into the five major components of what all IPM programs have. Uh, pest identification, monitoring and population assessment, uh, control action guidelines, prevention, and then also integrating all of your management tools together. And so I just wanted to break these down real briefly. Uh, just the idea of what they are and why they're important. Pest identification is fairly straightforward, and the book dedicates an entire chapter to pest identification. And uh, we're not really going to bother with that in this class because if you're in this class, you've taken uh, at least economic entomology and chances are you've taken a pathology or a weeds class uh, or a mycology class. So you're familiar with most pests and what they look like. But the major idea here is uh, have someone turn off some of the lights. I think I just need these two middle rows off. But the major idea here is that uh, since, that's excellent, thank you, is that since IPM is supposed to be so information intensive, we want to, uh, and all control methods should be tailored to the specific pest you have, we want to make sure that we know what pest we're looking at, uh, which can be challenging because some pests are going to have similar appearances, uh, such as these two guys. We've got a uh, brown marmorated stink bug, which is an invasive species uh, that's somewhat recently been introduced to California and is now just starting to show up in the Central Valley. Uh, it hangs out about everywhere you get them in your houses. They're just kind of annoying in general. And right here is a rough stink bug, which is a uh, beneficial stink bug. It preys on uh, pest insects and tends to live in orchards. And so as you can tell, the two of them look extremely similar. To tell them apart, you need to look at some of the banding on the antennas and the legs. And so it can be a little bit rough to tell them apart. So it's important to have a good idea since uh, you don't want to get rid of your rough stink bugs, but you definitely don't want to overlook brown marmorated. 
Similarly, you might have insects like stink bugs where the life stages look different, so they're kind of difficult to identify. And then also, you've got some pests, especially like pathogens and nematodes, where you're never going to see the pest. Uh, you're only going to see the symptoms that the plants leave behind. And sometimes those symptoms look a lot like other problems plants may have. For example, we've got the uh, symptoms of the tomato etch virus and magnesium deficiency here. And you can see that they're very similar to one another, but would call for very, very different approaches to trying to solve your problem in the field. And so basically having a, a network of people who you can consult with, PCAs, extension agents, uh, all sorts of people who can help you make these identifications is important and is a really key part of IPM. Monitoring and assessment. This is pretty plain in the sense that uh, IPM basically tells us to be smarter about the way we control, to avoid applying pesticides we don't need to, and the easiest way to do this is to regularly and systematically check your field in order to know what's out there, whether you have pests, whether you have pests that are maybe under control with beneficials. Uh, essentially, this is just taking a data-rich approach, seeing what's out there, and to a certain extent, even just uh, collecting data sort of quantitatively through things like weather posts and using weather data to predict when outbreaks may occur. As far as control action guidelines, these are essentially just guidelines uh, that tell us when intervention is needed. So we're taking the guesswork out of control. We're not just going out there saying, well, that looks like a lot of bugs, or, you know, those plants aren't looking so hot, let's do something. Basically, someone has gone out and done the research and established exactly when control should be applied uh, in order to basically make your money back. And this comes down to two basic measures that you've heard of before in economic entomology and in other classes, but the, uh, what the book calls the tolerable injury level, or what we call in economic entomology the uh, economic injury level, as well as the treatment threshold, which is sometimes called the economic or the action threshold. So tolerable injury level being the point at which the pest density, excuse me, the EIL or economic injury level being the pest density where the cost of control is equal to the damage that the pest would cause. So essentially it's our break even point, right? You don't want to treat before the economic injury level because then you are, or at least you don't want to treat way before the economic injury level because then you are spending money to control a pest that's not actually causing a whole lot of damage in your crop. Alternatively, you don't want to spend away after the economic injury level because then the damage has already been done and you're spending money and losing money in terms of yield. Whereas the treatment threshold or the economic or action threshold is the population density of the pest at which you should actually apply the control measure or basically the density that triggers the treatment. And the whole idea here is that if you treat at the economic injury level, it's going to be a little bit too late. It takes a couple days after you notice that the treatment needs to be uh, applied uh, before you could maybe get a written recommendation, before you can line up someone to go out into your field and do the application. And after a few of those days, the pest population may have already done some significant additional damage beyond the economic injury level. So just to visualize this, this is the classic economic injury level versus um, economic threshold uh, sort of figure that we show. Where essentially what we're looking at is a red stripe representing a pest population where we have on the x-axis time, on the y-axis we have the number of pests, such that basically in a typical uh, sort of pest situation where we have something in the field feeding on our plants, we expect that pest populations will increase exponentially over time. And if they're left untreated, they should sort of max out at a point where you have so many pests that they essentially limited themselves in how many you can have on your plants. Either they decrease the plant quality to such an extent they can't, can't keep growing exponentially. Uh, maybe you've gotten to a point in the season where the conditions aren't as good for them to grow. We'll talk about this in more detail later. But the main point is that the population eventually maxes out but it's going to be very high. And so uh, essentially we've got a... And then alternatively, if we control the population, it'll be the solid line that'll just sort of dip down. 
And so essentially what we've got is a trade-off between uh, when we control on how much benefit we get from the control in terms of how many insects we kill versus uh, how much the control actually costs. And the idea being that if you apply the control way down here, sort of where there's a low number of pests, then the total cost of the application is going to be greater than the benefit we get in terms of control, right? We're spending, say, $10 an acre on a pest that's causing $1 an acre worth of damage. So we're losing $9 an acre, in essence, worth of control. Plus, because pest populations grow exponentially, if we treat down here, we may knock down the population here, but it'll just grow exponentially and we might actually have an outbreak later on in the season that we have to treat again. So we're spraying twice instead of once. So treating too low is not a good idea. It costs money. On the flip side, if we treat way up here, uh, the benefit is substantially larger than the cost, but there's been a lot of damage already done. So the economic injury level kind of sits at this nice in-between point where if we're right here, the benefit is equal to the cost. So if the insect is going to cause $10 worth of damage per acre, it just so happens to cost us $10 per acre to control it. We treat there, we break even, and we get to save our yield. And also that knocks down the population uh, long enough that uh, we probably aren't going to get another outbreak, at least in this particular case. However, one concern that you'll notice is that essentially when we decide to apply a control, like right here, there's kind of this population area right here where the population is still growing. And that's what I was talking about earlier. That's that period of time where you've decided to control, but you haven't applied the control yet because you are waiting for a written re recommendation, you're lining up someone to do the spray, maybe you need to purchase the actual chemical or biocontrol agent that you're going to use. Uh, alternatively, maybe you're using a technology like a microbial or an insecticide or tillage or something where it doesn't have an immediate effect. You've got a little bit of a delay between application and control, at which point the pest population is still growing. So if we were to use the economic injury level, that little hump would go up here and we would be losing more than we'd be saving. Hence, we have an economic threshold set up, the point at which we decide to do control, which is set up just far enough below economic injury level that in a typical pest population, we would expect that um, if we caught them at this point, we'd have maybe somewhere between three to seven days in order to do a um, treatment before we would have an economic injury level size population. So the fourth aspect was preventing pest problems. So this was kind of the real meat and potatoes of Stern et al., that their big deal was that we needed to uh, create ecosystems where we could push that equilibrium position of the pest down. If you remember, the general equilibrium position was the average pest population. So we want to use tools like resistant plants, cultural controls, uh, selecting sites that are generally not associated with pests, and also manipulating the habitats to make them unfriendly to pests so that that average pest size, pest population goes from being above the economic injury level to being well below it. And then finally, the recommendation that most people are familiar with IPM, the integration of our management tools. The idea that we don't want to rely on a single tool at any given time, but to have a sort of a multitude of them that we're all using together in order to provide even greater control. And this has two major benefits. Uh, the first of which being that it provides you with fail-safes. So if one of your control methods stops working, say you have a population that develops resistance, whether it's to say a, um, a resistant cultivar to a pesticide, then you might have something else to fall back on, like healthy biocontrol, uh, which will help provide some control while you try and find another solution. Uh, in addition to this, uh, these tools oftentimes work synergistically, so that ultimately the two different control tactics when used together provide more control than they would as individual tools, such as a resistant plant and biological control providing more control of the pest together than they would as individual pieces. And there's a fair bit of research to support this working. Uh, this is some research that was done by a team out of Iowa State uh, that I worked with a little bit during my grad school. 
And they were testing out uh, the synergy between using resistant plants and biocontrol against soybean aphid, which was an introduced pest to soybean systems. And so what they basically did was they planted uh, susceptible plants, as well as plants that had resistance genes against aphids, called uh, resistance to aphids glycines, or RAG genes. So on this x-axis, we've got different soybean lines. We've got susceptibles, RAG1s, RAG2s, and a pyramid one that has RAG1 and RAG2. And then we've got uh, cages where we have uh, essentially the dark bar, which is just the plants with no natural enemies, and then the light bars, which have biocontrol on them. And we have total amount of aphid damage, which is measured in CAD or cumulative aphid days. And so the general trend you can see is that when you introduce resistance genes, we see this general trend that the number of aphids, the amount of aphid damage, decreases. Uh, albeit not significantly between these ones, but you see a general decrease in the number of aphids found, the amount of damage they cause. But if you have a resistant plant with biocontrol, you see a pretty substantial decrease in the total aphid population to the extent that if you have a susceptible plant with biocontrol, you have a pretty substantial decrease in the number of aphids. But if you have a really resistant plant like this RAG1, RAG2 plant with biocontrol on it, we see virtually no aphids that the biocontrol works with these plants and we have almost complete control of the pest. So a lot stronger than they would be individually. So with that, let's move out of sort of our history lesson of what IPM was, where IPM came from. And let's move into the ecology section. So again, in economic entomology, we covered a little bit of insect ecology. This will be a little bit more of a broad uh, covering of ecology overall. And specifically, we'll be trying to look at ecology in terms of pest systems and uh, how it applies to IPM, since IPM is supposedly a um, ecology-focused system. So just as a reminder, ecology is the study of interrelationships. And specifically, we're looking at interrelationships between organisms and their surrounding environment. So we're interested in sort of how organisms interact with members of their own species, how they interact with members of other species, as well as how they interact with the non-living environment. So if we were talking about an agroecosystem, we would be interested in the crops as one organism, how the crops interact with one another, how they interact with pests, how those crops and those pests interact with the contents of the soil, the amount of irrigation they get, the amount of sunlight, and how all of these things create a functioning agroecosystem that we are managing. So in IPM, we oftentimes consider it to be a wing of applied ecology, or essentially a system in which we try to take ecological, ecological information, understanding of how pests interact with that agroecosystem, and then basically take advantage of that in order to reduce the amount of resources that the pests have in the ecosystem and in order to find and exploit weaknesses in the pest's life cycle. So essentially, the idea is that if we know how the ecosystem works, if we know what the insects or other pests use to their advantage, we can break those connections and we can make it a really unfriendly environment for them. And ultimately, yeah, uh, avoid having outbreaks in the first place. Uh, this is to the extent that some people refer to IPM actually as ecological pest management. You'll hear that in some areas. But ultimately, the whole idea that separates ecological pest management from IPM is that ecological pest management is all about increasing the strengths of natural systems to reinforce natural pest regulation, which is part of IPM, but isn't the whole thing. IPM is a much bigger thing in scope than just uh, basically reinforcing the strengths of natural systems. So we got some people writing. So basically, EPM, or ecological pest management, is a subset within IPM. All right. So the figure that keeps showing up in my ecology presentations. So ecology is all about interactions, right? Uh, but those interactions kind of happen across different levels of organization because we do have 
uh, individual organisms that interact with one another in populations. We have populations that interact with one another in communities. And these things just sort of stack on top of each other until we get these sort of multiple layers of ecosystems. And in terms of IPM, I think it's important to sort of dissect what these layers are and how we can look at these separately in different ways to control them and to control pests. So at the very bottom, we're basically moving from simplicity up to complex. So simple interactions all the way up to the most complex and largest ones. And at the bottom, we've got the individual. The individual is the base unit. The smallest part of an ecosystem is a single individual. In this case, a single ladybug at the bottom. When you get a number of ladybugs together in one place, they form the population, which in terms of interactions would be a question of interactions between individuals, all of the same species. Moving up from there, we have populations that can interact with one another, such as lady beetles interacting with the aphids they feed on, lady beetles interacting with the plants that they live on. We have larger scale questions. How do different populations work together? And then at the next level up, we have ecosystems, where we start moving away from things that are living, and we're looking at interactions between living things and non-living things, or what we would call abiotic aspects of the environment. So how do these different plants and animals, fungi, pathogens, interact with the soil, with the air, with the light, with the water? And then we move all the way up to the largest scale, which would be the biosphere, which is basically all life on Earth, which is large to the extent that it's impractical for IPM. So it's not something we really consider in depth in an integrated pest management system. Uh, but you could think of biospheres being sort of a question of how do things on a grand global scale, such as global climate change and the like, impact interactions uh, at multiple different levels. So in IPM, what we're really focusing on, in on most of the time is the individual through community level. Uh, with occasional forays into the ecosystem level. And so we'll be mostly focusing in on this uh, sort of square for right now. So looking at these levels, the individual is, as I mentioned, uh, the base unit of ecology. Kind of like atoms are the base unit of chemistry. They're about, well, that's not even true, right? You could go further down. You could go down to quarks and uh, whatever the subatomic sub-quark units are nowadays, since it's been a long time since I've taken physics or chemistry uh, at that level. But we'll go down to the atom level strictly for the purposes of chemistry and the idea of, um, of uh, elemental works and things like that. That essentially, uh, atoms function individually and have their own unique traits. Uh, but ultimately, uh, atoms can behave differently when they interact with one another. They can combine into unique forms to form molecules that have sort of their own uh, unique interactions and unique properties. So for example with water. Water is composed of oxygen and hydrogen. Uh, individually oxygen and hydrogen are these nice sort of gaseous forms. They have their own traits. They're uh, highly flammable, highly interactive. But when you interact together and form water, you get this very interesting highly polar molecule that is liquid at room temperature. They bind together nicely, forming these hydrogen bonds. They're a great solvent. They're just a really unique properties that are completely different from how the individual atoms behave. Similarly, in ecosystems, we see synergistic interactions between individuals to create systems that are much more complex than we would expect from their individual parts. You get things like ants, where Individual ants aren't particularly bright. Uh, they basically just follow their own individual little rules. They basically follow trails, they find food, they bring it back to the colony. But by following a couple simple little rules, you can get these really interesting emergent behaviors where you have colonies that do things that seem incredibly intelligent, like multiple ants working together to carry food, excuse me, uh, really specific behavior around caring, caring for the queen, specialized ant roles such as the caste system. Uh, essentially, you get all these interesting behaviors that are just individual dumb ants following simple rules uh, that they're programmed to do. And so we see lots of interesting emergent behaviors in ecosystems. And those are most of the things we're interested in in IPM. 
However, there are a few aspects of individuals that are important to look at individually, uh, one of which would be natural selection, that individuals do carry uh, their own genes, right? All individuals basically carry around their own copy of their genome, and that genome may have, uh, you know, particular mutations that were unique to their parents, and because they mixed half their, they got half their parents from their mother, half of them from their father, they've got these unique combinations that sort of uh, come out and determine who they are and what they are. And so these uh, basically determine, yeah, what I said here, physiology, behavior, morphology, all of the things that determine how they interact with the environment. And some of these genotypes, uh, or the genetics uh, determinants, are going to produce individuals that are more capable of surviving and reproducing than others, so that in the next generation they're going to be overrepresented, right? And so ultimately this leads to evolution in populations. This leads to populations of pests, uh, beneficials, of crops changing over the long run and becoming more well suited to their environment. Uh, you know, if they're living in an ecosystem, an agroecosystem where they're constantly being uh, sort of exposed to the same crop, you're going to select for individuals who feed on that crop the very best. If they're being exposed to the same pesticide all the time, you're going to select for individuals that survive that pesticide the very best. And so ultimately, what we see just is this idea that populations change over time just through natural selection because individuals carry around all this genetic variation. Uh, but one thing that we should note is that a gene or a genotype that a pest carries around isn't necessarily always a good thing to have. If the environment were to shift, that gene could suddenly go from being a beneficial thing to have to being a real liability. If we had a pest, for example, that was really excellent at feeding on corn, if you remove that corn and replace it with alfalfa, then all of a sudden it's going to be up the creek because it's not suited to feeding on that particular crop. And so the fitness of a gene may shift dramatically depending on how we choose to manage the system. And we can make it very unfriendly for them. Right. And so basically the whole point is that the characteristics of these individuals, their particular genes, is going to be determined by the environment. So the environment basically shapes the organisms we find in it. And it shapes the populations they live in. So what we do to manipulate the environment manipulates these pests. It manipulates these crops. Uh, so maybe not over the very shortest term, but over the long term, we can see very dramatic changes occur. And some of these changes can be really impressive. Uh, for example, this guy, the uh, Western corn rootworm. So major pest of corn all over the place, but it's uh, becoming a real big problem in the Midwest where they grow a ton of corn. So for a long time, so essentially the life cycle of this guy is it feeds on the corn, uh, on the silks, and it lays its eggs in the soil. When those eggs hatch, the larvae come out and they feed on the roots of the corn. Uh, when they pupate, the adults come out, they go up and they feed on the silks again. So you just cycle between sort of the silks down to the roots, up to the silks, down to the roots, over and over and over again. So for a long time, the really easy way to control this was you would rotate out your corn every year. So you do one season of corn, one season of some sort of bean. And so you got this nice advantage that you removed the roots that the larva would feed on so they would die out, and you also got to sort of energize your soil with a nice bean rotation. So a lot of extra nitrogen being put into the system. Uh, the problem is that even in a system where you completely eliminated the host for this pest, they managed to evolve a way to get around it. Uh, in this particular system, there were two cases. Uh, there were two cases of rotation resistance, one of which was the beetle developed eggs that would hatch after two years. So they would lay the eggs, they'd go an entire season without hatching, and then they would hatch the next year when the uh, corn was planted again. So basically, they'd just sort of ride out the beans and get to the corn. And that happened, but it wasn't a huge problem. You didn't get a whole ton of these, and growers could get around it by waiting a little bit longer and doing two years' worth of uh, beans and then putting in the corn the third year. But the real interesting one was that these guys changed their egg-laying preference. That at the end of the season, there are some beetles 
that would stop laying their eggs in cornfields, but they'd fly over to bean fields and lay their eggs there. So that the next season when those bean growers would lay corn, would put corn in the field, uh, they would have a ready-made habitat for them. So my main point is that we can put all sorts of pressure on these organisms, but there are all sorts of ways that they can get around these problems that we aren't thinking of. And that uh, just because there's so many of them and so much genetic variation, it can come out in really surprising ways. So we shape the system and the, shape, the system shapes us back. One interesting note, though, is that not all variability in pests is hardwired genetically. Uh, there is some variation that is due to the environment as well. So essentially, variation in pests, in their structure and what they do and what they feed on, is determined in one part by their genetic composition, but in the other part, it's also due to the environmental pressures they're under. And in some cases, well, not in some cases, but in all cases, the environment and this genotype interact to produce the expressed characteristic that we call the phenotype, right? So essentially, you have a genotype, it's expressed, uh, you have an interaction with the environment, and you produce the organism we see. And that organism has a series of phenotypes, whether that's height, color, uh, calorie content, all sorts of things like that. But there are some cases in which an organism has what we call phenotypic plasticity, which is essentially that under different environmental conditions, they can um, basically change the genes they express, or they can change how those genes are regulated so that they produce different phenotypes, even though the organisms are genetically identical to one another. And so you can get really drastically different results from similar systems. So the plant's a little hard to see, but let's start with the caterpillar. So a first example of this phenotypic plasticity would be, uh, this is a cat caterpillar species that feeds on oak leaves. And depending on the time of season it feeds on the plant, uh, or the particular gender of the plant it's feeding on, it will have different body forms. So oftentimes, when the caterpillar's feeding, it has sort of this light green-brown color in which it's mimicking the twig of the tree. So it'll sort of just hang out, stretching itself out from the tree, looks like a twig, camouflaging itself from predators. But during the, during the tree's mating season in the early spring, what it'll do instead is it will change its morphology so that it actually looks like one of the catkins, uh, the uh, reproductive structure of flowers on the tree. So here we have some catkins, and here we have the actual caterpillar. So these guys are the exact same species. In some cases, you can take uh, members from the same brood of eggs, so we know that they're very similar to one another genetically. You can expose them to different conditions and cause them to produce different routes, have different phenotypes. It's all just about that environmental conditioning. And we see this more often in plants than we do in insects. Uh, this is all uh, uh, the same weed species. Off the top of my head, ah, it's sow thistle. There we go. So sow thistle has very different uh, sort of plant structures based on drought conditions as well as how direct the sun is. So in very dry conditions, the sow thistle tends to produce very long stalks puts out tons of flowers and seeds in order to sort of escape its dry surroundings, try and get somewhere else. Under relatively wet conditions, it tends to bush out, put a lot of effort into vegetative growth. And uh, sort of in shady conditions, we get sort of these little stubby guys that also invest a fair bit in flowers. And so essentially, we just see all sorts of different constructs based on the environment. All right. So, last thing I wanted to say about individuals is the idea that individuals and species in general uh, live within habitats, but they have what we call an ecological niche as well. And these are two distinct concepts. So a habitat is the environment that the individual or the population lives within. So this would include things like uh, the other populations it interacts with, uh, the abiotic environments of so the soil, uh, the amount of sunlight, the water, those sorts of things. That would be its habitat. But then the organism also has what we call a ecological niche or niche. And so what a niche is, is it's essentially the place within the habitat uh, that the organism holds in relation to its food and to its natural enemies. So 
I think an easier way to think about this is to think about an ecological niche as kind of being the organism's role in the community. What does it do? If we were to try and ascribe a purpose to an organism, what is it? Uh, so what does it eat? What eats it? How does it reproduce? Are there any ecosystem services it provides? Uh, those things would all sort of fall into what is the niche of this organism or what this organism's niche is. Uh, and by sort of extrapolating from that, you can also think of a niche as being sort of the mixture of conditions and resources required for the organism to stay within the habitat. So, for example, uh, well, let's just move on to the next slide real quick for an example. For an example, let's talk about uh, anopheles. So if we were to boil down habitat and niche to two more simple definitions, that a habitat tells us where to expect pests, and a niche tells us what the pest's role is in the community or what it needs to survive, let's look at a system like anopheles. So anopheles are commonly known as sort of the malaria mosquitoes in a lot of cases. And they're pretty typical mosquitoes. So if we wanted to sort of categorize a habitat for them, it would be places with stagnant water and host animals, uh, typically mammals or birds, something that they can easily get blood from. But if we wanted to spell out what their niche is, so sort of their purpose, what they do within the ecosystem, we could say that they are blood-feeding parasites. That's sort of what they eat. Uh, they are also food sources for insectivores. So they are basically eaten by other things that like to eat insects. That's sort of a simple way to get at the difference between a habitat and a niche. Where they live versus what they do. What's useful in IPM is we can take advantage of knowing an organism's habitat and niche in order to provide control. So knowing these two things about these things about mosquitoes, for example, what is something we could do to a habitat to make it less mosquito friendly? Dry it out. Right, we could dry it out. We could get rid of all the stagnant water. So we could do that to make the habitat less friendly. Introduce insectivores. Yeah, we could create a system in which we have more insectivores flying around. So we could introduce uh, natural enemies that would be predaceous insects. We could produce uh, bird, uh, perching spaces for insectivorous birds or bat boxes, those sorts of things. Use insect repellent. Could use insect repellent. That might be a little bit less niche based, but that's always an option. Can use insect repellent. Anything else? Move those animals if possible. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you could. And so, yeah, if you have a particular host animal in an area and you have the ability to move it, you could. Uh, that's a way that sometimes they do tick control is uh, they have eliminated some tick species from Texas by mandating uh, sort of cow quarantine areas. They would have pasture lands where you're not allowed to put your cows out for a few years. And they basically rotated around the pasture lands so that the entirety of certain counties would be cow-free during time, different times of year. And they managed to move the ticks out of those areas because they no longer had the cattle to feed on. And that way they removed a lot of uh, tick-borne diseases from those systems. So real simple stuff. So we have these, yeah, like you said, removing stagnant water, removing the hosts, uh, increase insectivore activities. There's lots of ways we can manipulate ecosystems to take advantage of niches and habitats. Now, some tricky thing with niches. One thing is niches can be different depending on the life, chain, life stages of the organism. So basically, niches can change. Niches aren't always the same. Uh, this is especially true in insects, where you've got things like the tomato hornworm up here, where in its larval stage, it's herbivorous, it feeds on plants, uh, especially solanaceae, whereas the adults are nectivorous. They like to go around and pollinate plants. So you get kind of this trade-off where it's like, do you want pollinators or do you want to get rid of the pest? Uh, alternatively, if you want to take out the adult form, you need a very different kind of control program than you would need against the actual larva. Uh, similarly, some insects change their niches based off of um, their reproductive cycle, that sometimes they need what we would call a secondary host. Uh, so for example, wheat stem rust can't complete its life cycle just within wheat. It needs a secondary host barberry to exist. So its niche shifts during its life cycle. So we can always remove barberry in order to provide control. And finally, niches may be different in different climates. 
So uh, Xylella fastidiosus, or fastidiosa, it's the bacterial pathogen that causes Pierce's disease in grapes and has been kind of a big problem, especially vectored by the glassy wing sharpshooter we talked about. So this is a big problem here in the Central Valley and California in general when you're talking about grapes. But a lot of research has demonstrated that this particular uh, pathogen is actually found extensively on the East Coast throughout the forest in a wide variety of plants. They find it in oak trees, they find it in little shrubs and the like, and it causes no problems there. And it's kind of this question of what is it about that particular habitat or those particular hosts which makes this a completely benign uh, bacteria versus something here in California and with grapes in particular that makes it such a problem. All right, so just to review the individuals, basic ideas, individuals can carry genetic information that can be selected for or against by the environment. And so essentially we see that ecological forces can shift the genetic traits of a population. They can uh, generally make some traits favorable, some traits not so favorable, and that individuals uh, may change their genes through natural selection to meet the needs of those particular habitats. And also that individuals live within habitats where they have a specific niche that they fit into. Uh, that niche oftentimes is associated with a particular role that they have, and these oftentimes can be species specific, and we can manipulate them in order to provide control. All right. We've got time. Let's get through density, and I think we'll be sitting on good ground for next, uh, for Thursday. So moving up from individuals, we're going to get into populations. And populations are really, uh, they're really the stage at which we perform most pest control, right? Because individuals can cause some damage, but we're not usually concerned about one pathogen, you know, hanging out in our crop. We're concerned about a whole host of them clogging up the, uh, you know, the, uh, the xylem or the phloem or something, or causing necrosis. You need large numbers to cause problems. So a population, again, being the group of individuals of the same species, and they need to be uh, occupying a, the same distinct space. So essentially the whole idea here is that you need a whole bunch of individuals that are all the same and are close enough to one another that they can reproduce with one another so that they can be sort of self-replicating. And so where we draw lines between populations can be a little tricky uh, because oftentimes it's basically suited to whatever is most convenient to us from a control perspective. So if we're looking at, say, Ligus bug, is the Ligus bug population just all the Ligus inside the field of cotton we're trying to treat? Is it all the Ligus bug? in the fields around our field as well, areas where we suspect migrants might come for, from? Or if a Ligus bug can fly 20 miles you know, throughout its lifespan, is it all the Ligus bug within a 20 mile radius? Uh, in reality, there's no real clear answer. It's basically whatever you need to do in order to basically accomplish what you're trying to do. So if you're trying just to control them in your field, then you're probably only concerned with the ligus in your field. And that's a perfectly fine place to set it up. So, as far as populations are concerned, there's really two major things we're oftentimes looking at. We're looking at density, which would be the number of individuals in a defined space. So, essentially you need a count of individuals in a specific area, so like weeds per square foot or aphids per plant. Then we're also interested in distribution. So, how the individuals are spread within the particular habitat we're looking at. So in IPM, we're very interested in both of these, primarily because density answers questions of how many pests there are, are they near the economic injury level, are populations growing, or are they shrinking, uh, whereas distribution tells us where the pests are in a field, uh, whether they are you know, highly clumped, if they're spread out. It also tells us where natural enemies are and if they're providing any control. So let's look at density real quick. This is a new slide, so I don't think... No, it's not. You should have this one. So population density can be shifted by ecological factors, right? There are natural processes that basically determine how likely an individual is to survive or how likely they are to die. And so 
what would be some factors in the environment that may change the survivability of, say, a pest organism, let's say an insect? So you got some caterpillars kind of crawling around. What are some natural factors that might cause them to survive better or to die? Temperature. Right, temperature, climate. So we might have weather conditions uh, that have you either the temperature gets too cold and they don't do well, temperature goes up and they uh, grow faster since they're cold-blooded. Maybe not enough rain, too much rain. Other things? Predators. Predators? Yeah, yeah. So we've got natural enemies that may show up. Right? They may uh, feed on them, knock them down. Harvest. Harvests? Yeah, so in agroecosystems, uh, we could generalize that to food availability, right? That uh, if we harvest, we remove all the food that they are going to feed on. So that's not great for them in natural ecosystems. Maybe we would have something a little more general, like the end of the plant's life cycle. Well, moisture. Moisture? Yeah, moisture is a good example. So that fits in with climate, but also in agroecosystems, we have to consider irrigation. So we may be introducing water or um, removing water when they need it. Maybe introducing water with pathogens. Yeah, or yeah, we may be introducing uh, the exact same things we don't want. And so yeah, there's lots of different things uh, that basically cause organisms to survive better or worse within ecosystems. And so ultimately, when we talk about these ecological factors, uh, all these ones we've listed, there's one important distinction we oftentimes make in IPM, which is factors, uh, well, I got ahead of myself. Essentially, oftentimes we distinguish between factors uh, that are stronger when the populations are higher versus factors that stay the same strength all the time. We call these density independent versus density dependent population factors. And we'll go into more detail on that in just a minute. Yeah, population dependent, density and density independent and dependent factors. So, overall, the major factors that oftentimes contribute to population density are broken down into four major camps. There's birth rates or natality, there's death rates or mortality, and then there's immigration and emigration, right? So terms that we've come across a few times, in ecology classes, in classes like this where we go over ecology briefly, uh, with immigration being the number of individuals that enter a population versus emigration being individuals that are migrating out of populations. And so in general, when we're trying to figure out how population density is changing, whether we see the populations increasing or decreasing, uh, we use a very simple sort of equation where it's the amount of births plus the number of immigrants coming into the population minus the number of them that die versus the numbers that leave the population. And so this isn't a really specific sort of equation. We don't have any real units set up here. This is just a general construct to help us think about how populations change, such that if we have a lot of births and a lot of immigrants, we expect populations to go up. If we have a lot of emigrants, Leaving the population or a lot of deaths, we expect populations to go down. And so, yeah. See, I put this slide in. I should have cut it out of the last one. So essentially, ecological factors that alter these densities, so ecological factors that cause more births, deaths, immigration, or emigration, um, can be divided into these two major characters I talked about just a second ago. Those, uh, and these are separated by basically whether the intensity changes as the population becomes more dense or less dense. So let's just talk about this real quick, density independent factors. So density independent factors are factors whose intensity is not dependent on the number of individuals in the population. So what does that mean? Essentially, it means that this factor when it comes in, whether it's a climactic factor the loss of a host, um, some sort of predator that comes in. Essentially, when it shows up, the proportion of the individuals that are affected is the same whether the population has high density or low density. So it doesn't matter if you have a ton of the pests or very little of the pests, we accept, we expect that about the same percentage of them are going to die no matter what. So for example, let's say we have a pest here. Uh, they're represented by these little red dots, and let's say they're living in a river valley up in the mountains. So that um, essentially on one side of the river, 
the river being this pathetic little blue line up through the middle. Let's say on one side of the river we have a really high density population. So there's a lot of uh, these guys just sort of hanging out right here. And on the other side we have a very low density population. And just for the sake of this example, let's say this is some sort of shrubby plant just growing out in the wild. Now let's say one day there is a population density uh, affecting factor that happens. And in this case it's a flood. So let's say that there's a whole bunch of meltwater, the whole valley floods, and uh, it turns out that these plants aren't flood tolerant. So, you know, if they're in an area that gets flooded, they just die out. But as it happens, some of these plants just randomly are growing on little high patches of land. They don't get flooded. They survive. And so when the floodwaters recede, we have a slightly different distribution of plants in the system. Uh, but if we look at them and we calculate out the percent mortality, so on this side we had 10 of the 13 die, on the low side we had 3 of the 4 die, we see that the total proportion that got killed was pretty equal. About 3 quarters, 77 versus 75 percent of them died. And this is because the flood basically killed everybody who wasn't sitting on high land. And high land is determined not by how many of uh, the shrubby plants there are, it's dependent on just random chance of whether or not those shrubby plants ended, ended up in those spots. It also just depends on how much land is sitting above the flood level. So it's completely random. So we would say that this is a density independent factor. Doesn't matter if you have more plants or if you have less. And typically, density independent factors are sort of what we would call acts of God or natural events like fires, floods, droughts, things that just sort of show up and they kill indiscriminately. Um, alternatively, what might be some things that happen in agroecosystems when we're controlling pests uh, that would be density independent? They kill sort of the same percentage of pests regardless of whether we have a whole lot of them or very few of them. Chemical applications. Yeah, so like a chemical application, right? If you go out and spray a chemical in a field, it doesn't matter if you have, you know, uh, you know, 100 aphids per plant or if you have 2 aphids per plant, we expect about the same proportion of them to die. Anything other than chemicals? Tillage. Tillage, right? Yeah, tillage, we're just randomly turning up all the dirt, so we expect the same proportion to die as well. So yeah, I, I put that resistant cultivars as well. We expect them to be the same way, mating disruption, rotation, pesticides. All of those are going to be independent. So I've already kept you after. We'll move into density-dependent factors when we get back on Thursday.